In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we take up patterns of force. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of Trekking Through Compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Episode 50, Patterns of Force. In this episode of Tracking Through Compliance, we consider the episode Patterns of Force, which aired on February 16th, 1968, and occurred on start date 2534.0. Story synopsis. When the Enterprise approaches the inner planet Ecos to investigate the cessation of communication with researcher John Gill, it is attacked by a rocket carrying a nuclear weapon. This is puzzling as well as dangerous since neither the outer planet Zeon nor the inner planet Ecos is technologically advanced enough to possess weapons or nuclear warheads. The Enterprise retreats to maximum orbital distance and Kirk and Spock beam down after having positioning broadcasting transponders surgically implanted in case of a mishap. Kirk and Spock discover that a Nazi movement has swept the planet complete with the genocide of the Zion pigs residing on Ecos. They view a public newscast in which the Iron Cross second class is presented to Darius, hero of the fatherland. Kirk and Spock are shocked to learn that John Gill appears to be the leader of the planet's Nazi movement. When they are approached and questioned by a Nazi lieutenant, lieutenant, they overpower him and Spock steals his uniform. Spock then pretends Kirk is a Zion he has captured and nerve pinches a Gestapo commander who wishes to take charge of Kirk. That provides Kirk's uniform, and Spock compliments Kirk by telling him, you should make a very convincing Nazi. As Kirk and Spock make their way to see the Fuhrer, they are confronted by a Nazi SS major after Spock neglects to salute him. The major becomes suspicious, and Spock is exposed when he is forced to remove his helmet. Spock and Kirk are then whipped in the process of being interrogated. Nazi party chairman Enig interrupts the questioning and tells the Nazis to lock up Kirk and Spock for an hour in contradiction to the standing orders to execute prisoners after their interrogation. In prison, Kirk and Spock speak to an imprisoned Zion whom they previously encountered being beaten on the streets by the Nazis. They find the Nazi movement began several years ago according to Uh, Correspondingly with the arrival of John Gill, they escaped from prison by making a primitive laser from the rubidium crystals in their transponders using the cell's incandescent light bulb as the excitation source. Not quite a flash arc and ruby crystal, but close enough in a pinch. Spock hides outside the cell and then nerve pinches the guard when Kirk summons him under the pretext of wanting to talk. Kirk and Spock allow the Zion, the Zeon prisoner, to tag along. Kirk and Spock penetrate the Nazi headquarters with the help of Secretary Doris and Chairman Enig. They discover Gill is only the drugged puppet of Deputy Fuhrer Melikon after he gives a stilted speech unleashing the final assault on Zeon. McCoy is beamed down and manages to barely overcome the drug. Gill tells him that he started the Nazi movement to unify the planet because it was the most efficient system on Earth he knew. With an extra hypo from Kirk... Gill manages to call back the invasion fleet and denounce Melikon as a traitor. Melikon grabs a machine gun and kills Gill, only to be shot himself. Chairman Enig then takes over and stops the killing, declaring it is time to live the way our Fuhrer intended. Kirk and Spock then return to the Enterprise in peace. So what's the fun fact on this episode? Not that there are many fun facts. Well, John Meredith Lucas wrote this episode out of his fascination with the functioning of totalitarian regimes, especially Nazi Germany, and their ability to stay in power. William Shatner quoted him to Chris Kresge in the Star Trek Memories as saying, it was fun to write a well-meaning Nazi, a guy who for the right cause completely screwed everything up. You know, we started with the question, how did the Nazis get past the street gangs and take root basically among the decent people. How did sane, reasonable adults buy into this? The answer seemed to be it was because it was efficient and society was beset with all kinds of problems, and it seemed like a feasible necessity. So it becomes feasible, and people take that leap. The screenwriter of this episode, John Meredith Lucas, 
wrote the episode out of his fascination with the functioning of totalitarian regimes, especially Nazi Germany, and their ability to stay in power. Shatner quoted him to Chris Krasecki in Star Trek Memories as saying, quote, it was fun to write a well-meaning Nazi, a guy who, for the right course, completely fucked everything up. You know, we started with the question, how the hell did Nazism get past the shits and street gangs and take root among basically decent people? How did sane, reasonable adults come to buy into this BS? The answer seemed to be because it was efficient and because in a society beset by all kinds of problems, it may have seemed like a feasible necessity. So it becomes feasible and people take that leap, end quote. An early draft of the episode had the source of the cultural contamination arriving aboard a small ambassador-class vessel called the Magellan. The name was later applied in TNG to the ambassador class of ships in the 24th century. No star date is logged in this episode. B. Joe Trimble gave it a star date of 2534 in her Star Trek Concordance, uh, and that's what we use in this episode. So, a troubling episode to watch in the 60s. I think actually the Nazis were much more seen as a defeated enemy uh, than the evil they were uh, now uh, associated with. So I think it's even more poignant to watch it or rewatch it in 2022 than when it originally came out. What are the compliance lessons today? Well, first of all, what happens when good men go bad? I mean, have you thought about the fraud triangle? Is it a part of your uh, anti-corruption analysis? Obviously, the fraud uh, triangle gives you the basic indicia uh, to understand how people will commit fraud. And, of course, corruption is a subset of fraud, so it applies. If you overlay Jonathan Marks' fraud pentagon, uh, you see additional factors. But the bottom line is... Uh, if someone is predisposed to go bad, uh, predisposed to steal, or predisposed to engage in bribery and corruption, if you present them with the pressure and the opportunity, and therefore, and thereafter a rationalization, you can certainly see how this could lead to fraud, bribery, and corruption. So is this something that you even think about within your compliance program? Next up. Who within your organization is one of the best assessors of your risk? Well, I would submit to you it is the sales organization. So when was the last time you talked to your sales organization and asked them, are any of our competitors doing anything dodgy? Uh, I have lived overseas as an expat, and I will tell you that the expat community um, is usually pretty small. And within a certain industries, I was in the energy industry at the time, and within that industry, uh, everyone knew everyone from the other company. In large part, we socialized together. Our wives got together. And people knew who was engaging in bribery and corruption uh, because uh, certainly when it came to government officials, uh, all of the contracts were let via RFP. So if somebody got a big deal that didn't go through the RFP process, everyone knew about it. So when did you talk about or when has the last time you talked to your sales force in high-risk countries. And then finally, regime change. Regime change has become a very high-risk issue, and I don't mean Saddam Hussein regime change. I mean democratically elected regime change. So if there's regime change, you better get ready because there may well be a corruption investigation by the new regime. Join us tomorrow where we take up the episode by any other name. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.